Hi Ravens. We're going to continue reading from Jennifer Donnelly's Poisoned. This is um, winter break reading number three of four. Will and Arno both pushed the lid with all their might. It slid off the tomb, hit the floor, and smashed into pieces. Will looked inside. There were no bones there. Instead, there was a rickety wooden ladder leaning against one of its inner walls. It led down into a black hole. The fire was pushing through the gate now and licking at a coffin just past it. The choking smoke swirled around Sophie, blinding her and making her cough. Time to go, Arno said. He nodded at Sophie. Get her, will you? Sophie, come on, Will shouted, reaching for her. She was coughing uncontrollably. Tears had washed smeary tracks through the soot on her cheeks. I'm sorry, Will, she sobbed. I'm so sorry. It's all right. There's a way out, Will said, pulling her to the tomb. Sophie didn't believe him, not until she looked down into the hole. Where does it go? She shouted over the noise of the flames. Out, Arnold replied. Help me with my bags. Half a dozen leather sacks, their necks tightly cinched, littered the floor around the tomb. Arno picked up one and dropped it into the hole. Will did the same. Sophie, frightened and dazed, grabbed one, but her hands were shaking so badly she lost her grip on it. Its side split open as it hit the ground. Jewelry spilled out. Rings, necklaces, and an earring still attached to a shriveled black ear. She gave a sharp cry at the sight of it. Arno smiled sheepishly. It was dark. I was rushing. Couldn't get the damn thing out, he explained. He scooped the jewelry up and stuffed it and, and, and split the sack into his rucksack. Sophie lifted her eyes from the jewels to Arno. The tea in his cheek stood out in the orange light. You're a grave robber, she said. We all have our flaws, Arno said. Pick up those bags now, would you? It's getting a little warm in here. The fire had devoured the coffin near the gate and had leapt to several others. Flames crackled only a foot away from where the three now stood. As Sophie and Will hurriedly tossed the rest of the sacks into the hole and in their own rucksacks, Arno made a torch out of a coffin, slat and a piece of some someone's shroud. He'd dropped his rucksack into the tomb and then threw a leg over its side. He found the ladder with his foot and quickly brought his other leg over. Follow me, he said. He was at the bottom of the ladder in no time. Will lowered Zara to him and then Sophie to climb down. By the time Will was on the ladder himself, the flames were licking at the tomb. He speedily joined the others and found himself in a low, narrow passage hollowed out of the earth. What is this place? Sophie asked. An escape tunnel, probably made for priests during one religious war or another, Arno said, shrugging into his rucksack straps. It was in bad shape when I discovered it. I fixed it up. Is it safe? Sophie asked, looking around uncertain. Arno snorted. Safer than death? Yes. He picked up two sacks and then motioned for Sophie and Will to do the same. Stay close. Let's go. The three made their way through the tunnel, crouched low. It was dark. Cold water dripped from the ceiling. After walking for about five minutes, they came to another ladder. Arno climbed the first rungs and then Sophie. Then Will handed up Arno's sacks, Zara, and their own things before climbing up himself. They found themselves in a mausoleum, a large one, about 50 yards down the hill from the church. Shouts, cries, and the whoosh of crackle of a raging fire carried in through the barred door. They all walked over to it. Carefully, to stay in the shadows, they peered through its iron filigree at the conflagration about them. The villagers of Grosseldorf surrounded their ancient church, some pressing hands to their cheeks, others crying. Kraus and his men, feigning concern, kept the people back from the fire, shouting that it was too dangerous for them to go close. I am staying put for the night, Arno said. There are too many soldiers around for my liking. He made himself a bed in the dark corner of the tomb and was soon sound asleep. Will did the same. Sophie sat down next to him, um, but they couldn't sleep. She stayed up all through the night watching as Hakon rode off with Kraus and his soldiers, watching old men weep as the bell tower crashed down, as the walls caved in. She was still up at dawn, staring at the ruins. 47. The sound of rattling startled Sophie. She jerked awake, opened her eyes. Light was pouring into the mausoleum through its windows and door. She closed her eye again, 
trapping vivid swirls of orange and gold behind her eyelids. For a few terrible seconds, she was back inside the crypt as the soldiers set the place off on fire. She could see the fire rising and smell the smoke and hear herself screaming. St. Sebastian was a smoldering heap of ash and debris now, and so were her hopes, her future, her shame. Shame burned inside her, as hot as the flames that had devoured the church, as she realized that her stepmother, the people at court, they were right. She was foolish. And weak. She trusted Hakon because he was beautiful and dazzling, because he'd spoken a few romantic words to her and made her believe that he loved her. Her heart had been her undoing, yet again. Something moved underneath Sophie, jostling her. She became aware that her head was resting on a warm, breathing creature. Her arm was slung across it. Zara, she thought, hugging the dog for comfort, but Zara didn't didn't feel like herself, and she didn't smell like herself. She reeked of smoke, but under that, there were the scents of pine, leather, lavender, sweat. Sophie picked up her head. It wasn't Zara. She was hugging. It was Will. Mortified, she pushed herself up on her arms. She remembered sitting next to him in the dark as he slept. I must have fallen asleep, then toppled over like a sack of onions, she thought. The rattling came again. Sophie blearily looked around. It was Arno. He was moving around the mausoleum, pushing on coffin lids, looking for loose ones. Morning, he called out when he saw her. Is your sweetheart up? Sophie blinked at him. M my what? Who? Him? He's not, Will's not my... Arno looked at her, still half slumped across Will. He cocked an eyebrow. Don't worry, he said. I'll never tell. Sophie quickly got to her feet. She brushed some imaginary dust off her trousers. Zara, who'd been curled up nearby, immediately settled herself in the warm spot Sophie had left. Will mumbled in his sleep, rolled on his side, and put his arm around the dog. Strange arrangement, you ha three have, said Arno, but who am I to judge? He rattled another coffin. The villagers had gone. The soldiers, too. We, we might want to get um, gone as well. Captain Crappy and the Pisspot Prince think we're dead, which means they won't be looking for us. That gives us an advantage. Sophie nodded. Her hair was loose. It stunk of smoke. She bent down to her rucksack and rooted in it for a ribbon so she could braid it out of her face. As she did, something winked brightly from across the tomb. Arno had pulled the bag of jewelry that had split open out of his rucksack and had placed it on a coffin. Pale rays of morning sunshine bounced off the rings, brooches, and necklaces spilling out of it. Sophie looked at all the ill-gotten goods with disgust, remembering the shriveled ear. Arno saw her eyeing his cash. Fancy yourself a ruby ring, he asked. I do not, Sophie said distastefully. You took those from a corpse. You're a grave robber. You steal from the dead. How can you do that? Arno snorted. He gave her a scalding once over. You're royalty, he said. You steal from the living. How can you do that? I've never stolen anything in my life, Sophie said, offended. You look more like a farmhand than a princess right now, Arno said, walking up to her. But I bet before the wolves ate you or whatever the hell happened, you wore silk gowns, diamond rings, and a gold crown too. Yes, I did. What of it? Where'd the money come from? You earned them? Well, I... It's not as if we don't... How about the castles and the palaces and the carriages? You earn those? He bent down to her and drew a T on her cheek with a dirty finger. Thief, he said, chuckling. Sophie smacked his hand away, scowling. She had rubbed the T off and then resumed her search for a ribbon. Arna resumed his for a hiding place, and Will woke as Sophie was finishing her braid. Their eyes met. Not a word about handsome princess, she warned him. Too raw for any mocking. Not one. Will winced at that, as if her assumption pained him. There was a beat of silence, and then he said, What are you going to do? You can't go to Scandinay now. Her hope of Hakon, getting her heart back for her, was gone. There would be no army to march up upon the King of Crow's castle. Her clockwork heart would wind down soon, and probably out of some lonely, godforsaken part of the dark wood. Where will you go? The Duke of Niederheim's to his castle, Sophie said lightly. It's not far. Do you know that your nose crinkles when you lie? Sophie scowled. You don't have anywhere to go, do you? No, Sophie admitted, ashamed of lying, ashamed of needing to, but the truth was she had no one, and it was painful to her. Her whole life she'd been surrounded by people, everyone from nurses and chambermaids to powerful dukes and ministers. 
but she could not trust any of them. They served her stepmother or Hakon now. There was not one person from her old life whom she could turn to. You could come home with me, rest a little, eat some home cooking. I'll come home with you, Arno said. I could use a little home cooking. Sophie and Will ignored him. I can't do that, Will. I almost got you killed last night. I'm not afraid of Hakon. You should be, Sophie said. You should be afraid of anyone who wants power as badly as he does. Sophie, Will, thank you, really, but I have bigger problems than Hakon, and I I don't have time to... I... Oma? Will called out. I've brought... Oops. Sorry, I skipped a page. I don't have time to... I... I... This and I that, Arno cut in. Maybe it's not about you, Princess Precious. Ever think of that? Are you going to just let that vicious bastard, Hakon, run this country? If he was happy to burn us alive, what's he going to do to others who get in his way? Sophie had had enough of this rude man. What do you want me to do, Arno? She asked, getting to her feet. Take your damn crown back. Sophie looked at his, him as if he'd lost his mind. Me? She said flatly. Just me without an army or weapons or a fortress? Just me and my skinny dog? I don't have even two pennies to buy breakfast. Just because you don't have two pennies or an army today doesn't mean you won't have them tomorrow. But I don't have a tomorrow, Sophie wanted to yell at him. Instead, she said, Arno, you don't know what you're talking about. Neither do you, you silly git. Sophie shook her head in amazement at his effrontery. You know, maybe I will take my crown back just so I can have you beheaded. You ever stayed in a hunter's house? You know how big it is? What they eat for supper? You might learn something about your own people, about their lives. Go to the kid's house for Pete's sake. Can't you see he wants you to? Arno winked. He held up a hand to the side of his mouth. I think he's sweet on you. Sophie turned crimson. Oh my God, Arno, that is not, that is so inappropriate. Will's married. Will, drinking water from his canteen, spat out. What? No, I'm not. But you said, you, what? I said, what? You said you had someone at home who needed you. Uh, my sister? Oh, Sophie blushed. Sophie's blush deepened. She wanted to fall through the floor. Arno clapped his hand. See, I was right. You learned something already. He shrugged his rucksack on, picked up a sword he'd hidden in the tomb, and took out his key ring. He'd cashed his jewelry and was ready to go. A minute later, he had the mausoleum door open. Come on, girl. Let's get some venison loin, dusted with black pepper and coriander, served with red currant sauce, maybe some Hasselback potatoes on the side, and braised cabbage. How about rabbit stew, Will asked. If I'm lucky enough to bag a few on the way, I'll take that too. The three walked out of the crypt into the sunshine. Arno lifted his face to the sun. He smiled, stretched his meaty arms wide. Ah, he said, it's good to be dead. 48. Sophie knew she was in trouble about a mile from Will's cottage. The ticking in her chest was slow and heavy and had been for the nearly two days walk. It stuttered, stopped, and then started up again. It wasn't loud. Sophie could only feel it, not hear it, but somehow that scared her even more. She was weak. Her limbs felt as if they were filled with sand. She stopped every now and again to throw sticks for Zara to fetch as she, Will, and Arno walked through the woods. But the playful, playful breaks were a ruse. She needed them to catch her breath and gather strength. She made it to the cottage only through sheer force of will. As she reached the small, tidy garden that surrounded the humble dwelling, Sophie saw an old woman sitting in the sunshine, carding a basket of wool. A little girl sat next to her. Her eyes were closed. Her face was tilted to the fading sun. She was bundled up to her neck in blankets, as if it were January, not August. Oh, Ma, Will called out. I've brought friends. The old woman turned around. Her eyebrows shot up in surprise. Her sharp eyes, the same gray as her grandson's, roved over Sophie and Arno. They lingered on Sophie's scar peeking out from the top of her shirt and on the T on Arno's cheek. The little girl scowled. This is my grandmother, Will said, and Greta, my sister. Oma, Greta, this is Sophie, Arno, and Zara. How do you do? Sophie started to say, but she never finished her sentence because her vision blurred and she stumbled and fell to the ground. Will and Arno helped her up. Heavens, what's wrong with her? The old woman asked, getting to her feet. She's as white as a sheet. I don't know, Will replied. Quick, boy, sit her up. As Will and Arno eased Sophie into Oma's chair, Oma hurried to the cottage. She returned a few seconds later with a bottle of vinegar and waved it under Sophie's nose. The sharp smell shocked Sophie's heart back into a steady rhythm. 
Thank you, she said gratefully. She felt a bit of strength return to her body. What's wrong? Will asked. Nothing. It was just a spell, Sophie lied. I felt dizzy. I have ever since the fire. It's probably from the smoke. She did not want to tell them the truth, that her heart was winding down. She could barely face it herself. Fire? Oma said smoke. It's a long story, Will said. Oma gave him a look. Stray cats, stray dogs, now a stray girl and a stray thief, Oma said. Do you find them, Will, or do they find you? Will chuckled. Sophie looked up and saw that he was holding his sister tenderly in his arms. The girl's limbs were as thin as matchsticks. Sophie had thought she was very young when she'd first seen her perhaps five or six, but now she realized the girl was ten or eleven. Her body was wasted. Sophie could see that she was not strong enough to walk on her own. The girl, her eyes huge in her face, drawn face, regarded Sophie closely. Hello, Sophie said, smiling at half her. You stink, the girl said. Greta, Oma scolded. Well, she does. Sophie knew she reeked of smoke, and probably worse. It had been a long time since she'd had a wash. May I use your bathtub? she asked. Oma laughed. She hooked her thumb over her shoulder. You don't have to ask my permission. Our bathtub is out there. Sophie craned her neck. She saw a silvery flow of water burbling behind the cottage. But that that's a creek. Yep, it is. Get her soap and a towel, please, Will, and for yourself and Arno, too. Arno looked as if he was going to decline the bath, but then surreptitiously sniffed his armpits and grimaced. Will put Greta down and disappeared into the cottage. But there's no privacy, Sophie protested, still staring at the creek. Walk downstream if you're bothered about it. No one to see you except he the deer here. The men can bathe upstream. You should make sure to wash the cut on your lip while you're at it. It's swollen. Use plenty of soap on it and wash your clothes while you're there. You can hang them on the line. But they're all I have. What do I wear while they're drying? You can borrow something. I can't have you bringing fleas into the house. Fleas? Sophie exclaimed, mortified. I don't have... I bet you do, said Greta, her eyes narrowing. You look like the type. Will, Oma bellowed, bring some old clothes. Will came back out of the cottage a few minutes later with everything his grandmother had asked him to get. He handed some things to Sophie and some to Arno. Will, did you get a rabbit? Can we have... St Greta called out, a fit of coughing cut off her question. Will knelt down by his sister, rubbed her back. The coughing got worse. Sophie was already heading to the creek. She stopped and turned around, concerned. Greta wasn't able to catch her breath. Her face was starting to turn blue. Her small hands were knotted in Will's shirt. Sophie started back to them, her heart knocking. But as she did, Greta managed to clear whatever was in her throat. She took a huge gulp of air and then sagged in Will's arms. He carried her into the cottage. Oma was right behind him, grim-faced. Sophie took a few uncertain steps toward them, but then stopped, feeling that she wasn't needed or wanted, so she continued on to the creek. When she got there, she saw that someone had dammed it with rocks to create a deep swimming hole. After hanging her towel and the clean clothes on a tree limb to keep them dry, she quickly undressed and dropped her filthy clothing onto the bank. Then she waded in, soap in hand. Zara followed her. The water was so icy it made her catch her breath, but it felt good too, especially when she ducked her head under and the water flowed over her swollen lip, numbing it. Nothing could numb the pain she'd felt over Hakon's betrayal, though. She'd believed him, trusted him, loved him even. At least she thought she had. She imagined her stepmother's smug satisfaction when Hakon told her that she, Sophie, was truly dead. Adelaide would smile and say what a hopeless fool the girl was, so soft-hearted, so clueless, so easy to manipulate. Shame's cold, reedy fingers clutched at Sophie as if she would, as if they would wrap around her legs, hold her down, and drown her. For a brief, bleak moment, she won wondered if she would simply let them. What good was she to herself, to anyone? But then she realized something. She had escaped, and neither Adelaide nor Hakon knew of it. Partly through luck, yes, she wouldn't have survived Hakon's treachery if not for Arno, but also through having sense enough to trust a good person, Will, and having the guts to run and hide and fight for her life. Let Adelaide and Hakon say what they liked. She wasn't hopeless. She escaped. She was alive, and neither of them knew it. Emboldened by this, emboldened by this realization, Sophie kicked the reedy fingers away with a noisy splash, she surfaced and sucked in a huge lungful of air. Who's the fool now? She whispered. And then she started to scrub. 
Sophie's last bath had been taken back at the hollow, and she hadn't realized how grimy she'd become. She attacked her body with the bar of soap, scrubbing every inch of it, and then working a cloud of lather through her hair. When she was done, she pulled her dirty clothing into the water and scrubbed that too. Then she washed Zara. The dog submitted to the bath, but ran out of the water as soon as she could and shook herself off. Sophie followed her out, dried herself off, and got dressed. The bath, the clean clothing, they made her feel as if she'd been reborn. She carried her wet things back to the cottage and pegged them onto the clothesline. The smell of cooking wafted out of the window. Onions, frying in butter, chopped thyme. Her stomach growled outrageously. No one was in the yard and the door to the cottage was open, so she went inside. Zara stayed outside to dry herself in the sun. Will was standing by a big black stove, his back to her, browning pieces of rabbit in a large iron pot. His hair was wet and he was wearing clean clothing too. Bretta, is she? She's lying down, he said curtly. Is she? She's fine. Your parents' cottage is very nice. It's not my parents, it's my grandmother's. Oh, but are your parents here? Where are they? Dead. Oh, I'm sorry. What happened to them? Death. Yes, well, you know what? That rabbit sure smells good, Sophie said with a sigh, giving up on trying to make conversation. After days spent trudging through the woods with them, she knew better than to try to get him to talk when he didn't want to. Will reached for a jug of ale. It was silent in the kitchen except for a loud, steamy hiss as he poured the liquid into the hot pan. Sophie, standing self-consciously with nothing to do, leaned against a cupboard and watched him. Will's face was flushed from the heat of the stove. She noticed that a tendril of hair trailed down the side of his face, curling like a question mark against his skin. His movements were deliberate and contained, like all hunters, Sophie thought. He was wearing his grandmother's apron over a worn linen tunic and patched trousers. She liked the way it looked on him, the way it had settled on his narrow hips, and the way the loosely knotted ties trailed down his backside. It's a rather lovely backside, she thought, tilting her head to get a better look. As she did, her heart gave a deep, warm purr. She straightened up, mortified. Will turned his head. He raised an eyebrow. Clock? Sophie smirked brightly. Clock. You could set the table. Yes, Sophie said eagerly. I could. I could do that. What is wrong with me? She wondered anxiously. Her clockwork heart was becoming more and more unreliable, behaving in ways that were totally contrary to her feelings. She didn't care for Will or his backside. Was this the spell she'd suffered? Signs that the heart was winding down faster than the brothers predicted? The idea worried Sophie, but she didn't have long to dwell on it. Will pointed to a cupboard and she opened it, found a clean cloth, and spread it over the round wooden table. Next, she set out napkins and cutlery and then decided that some flowers were needed. Taking a pair of scissors from a drawer, she clipped a few blooms from Oma's garden and arranged them in a vase. Oma, who'd been with Greta, making her drink a tea she'd brewed from the contents of the packages Will had brought home from the apothecary, now bustled by Sophie, with a loaf of bread and a dish of butter for the table. Quite a night you had in Grosseldorf, she said curtly. Will told me all about it, and more besides. Yes, it was quite a night, Sophie said, uncomfortable under the woman's disapproving gaze. We have Arno to thank for getting us out of the crypt. Mm-hmm. And I guess you have you to thank for getting my grandson into it, Oma said, and then she frowned. That lip's bleeding again. Sophie touched her fingers to the cut. They came away crimson. It's not going to heal by itself, said Oma. It'll be fine, I'm sure. I'm not, Oma said, fetching a bottle off the shelf, a scrap of linen. Sit there, she instructed Sophie, pointing at a stool under a window. The light's better. I need to see what I'm doing. Oma steered a reluctant Sophie to the stool and settled her on it. She uncorked the bottle and poured a bit of foul-smelling liquid onto the linen. Close your eyes, she said to Sophie. Does it hurt? Yes. Oma's concoction burned like liquid fire. Oh, ow! Sophie howled. Hold still. Don't be such a baby, Oma scolded. I ought to yay ye, Sophie protested as best she could without using her upper lip. Tears smarted behind her eyes, just as she thought they would spill over. She felt a hand slip into hers, rough and warm and strong. Squeeze hard, Will said. That stuff is the worst. Sophie did. Will squeezed back, and finally, after what seemed like an eternity, Oma finished. There, I'm done. It'll heal fast and clean now, she said, pressing the linen to the wound to blot the fresh blood. Take this. Keep the pressure on for a bit. Thank you, I 
think, Sophie said, opening her eyes and taking the cloth. Her lip was throbbing. Oma put the bottle back, and as she turned around, her eyes went to Sophie's hand and her grandson's. They were still clasped. I'm done, she said again. Will went back to his stew. Sophie pressed the cloth to her lip with both hands, and Oma walked outside to see where Arno was. As she did, she looked back over her shoulder at her grandson, humming now as he tended the stew. He never hummed. Then she looked at the girl, tilting her head, the better to cast glances in the boy's direction. Her brow furrowed. She muttered to herself, encounters in the dark wood, thieves, girls in trousers, nothing good can come of this. 49. Sophie had never smelled anything as delicious as Will's rabbit stew. He'd brought it to the table in the pot in which he'd cooked it. They were all sitting down, napkins on their lap. Zara had crawled to the table just in case anyone dropped anything. After putting the pot down, Will sat too. Arna was about to reach for a slice of bread when he saw Oma bow her head. Will and Greta did the same, and Sophie followed suit, and Oma gave thanks for their meal. As soon as she was done, Will took the lid off the pot and steam wafted out. Sophie's heart clanked. Oma raised an eyebrow. Greta, who had boosted herself up out of her seat and was leaning on the table with her hands, and Arno, who'd done the same thing, were too busy gazing at the stew pot to notice. It's a clock, Will said to Oma. A small one, Sophie said, that I keep in my pocket. Will handed Sophie the ladle, and Sophie carried away by the mouth-watering aroma, greedily scooped out vegetables, sauce, and a chunk of meat. And then another, and one more. It all smelled so good. Oma looked at Sophie's plate, and Sophie realized she'd taken more than her share of the stew. Oh, I'm so sorry, she said, blushing. She hurriedly shoveled most of it back. Food must be very plentiful where you're from, Oma said archly. It is, Sophie replied sheepishly. She was used to food just appearing, usually on silver trays. She'd never for an instant considered that where it had come from or what it was like to not have enough of it. Oma served Arno and then herself and her grandchildren, and then everyone was eagerly eating. Sophie was ravenous. It was all she could do to not shovel the stew into her mouth. Will told me and Oma that you're the princess, but I heard the princess died, so are you a ghost then? Greta asked. Oma snorted. With an appetite like that, hardly. Greta's face fell. So you're not a ghost? Not quite. Sorry, said Sophie with a rueful smile. Greta was about to say something else, but before she could, she started coughing again. And just like that, she coughed so hard she couldn't catch her breath. What's wrong? Sophie asked. But Will and Oma's attention was on Greta, and they didn't answer. Luckily, the fit didn't last as long as the one before had. It's wasting sickness, Greta said when she couldn't, could speak again. Hush, Greta, Oma scolded, pained by the girl's words. It is not. It's a bad cold that won't clear. You're under the weather, that's all. A bit run down. You... Greta cut her grandmother off. This cottage isn't very big. Oma and I hear you and Will talking at night, you know. Will said nothing, but he clenched his jaw so hard that a muscle jumped in his cheek. Sophie's heart twisted painfully. She knew that wasting sickness was a cruel disease that sapped its victim's strength and vitality, but took a long time to kill them. How did you get it? she asked. My mother. She had it. She was getting better, but then the queen took our farm, and she got worse. Why did the queen take your farm? She wanted the crops to feed her soldiers. We had acres and acres and grew all sorts of things. My mother was sick before the soldiers came, and she didn't last long afterwards, and then my father got sick, too. The Oma says he died of a broken heart. Sophie's own heart felt as if it were breaking apart. It made a slow, thumping noise, like the sound of a drum beating out a dirge. Now she knew why Will had said he despised her, the queen, the palace, and everyone in it, because her stepmother had destroyed his family. Sophie ached for him, for Greta and Oma, but her sadness was mixed with anger, too. Didn't Adelaide see what she was doing? Didn't she understand that her brutal actions carried terrible consequences for her people? She was so vigilant, so worried about threats from her enemies. She raised armies, built warships, all to keep her people safe. But in doing so, she herself had become their enemy. And what would happen if Hakon had his way and took over the Greenlands? Sophie knew things would get even worse. I'm so sorry, Greta, she said. I hate the queen, said Greta, clenching her fists. I hate the palace and everyone in it. They take everything. While we barely have enough to eat, I hate you too, Sophie. Greta, stop. That's rude, Will said. Oma's eyes flickered to Sophie and dangerous. 
Sophie's not like the queen, Arno said, gnawing on his bone. She's going to take her crown back and change things. Are you? Greta asked, a mixture of hope and disbelief in her voice. Sophie dropped her gaze to her plate. She couldn't answer Greta. Doing so meant extinguishing the hope in the sick girl's eyes. An uncomfortable silence descended, and as it did, a new kind of hunger gripped Sophie. This one was not in her belly. It was deep down in her faulty heart. For the first time, Sophie hungered for her throne, and that hunger was so great it was a physical pain. She hungered to sit straight-backed and regal upon the golden chair and to feel the sweet, somber weight of the Greenland's crown upon her head. Not so she could frighten ambassadors in a jewel-studded surcoat, not so she could build the world's greatest armada, but so she could make sure that a pregnant woman was never thrown out of her home, that a teenage boy who'd lost his sight fighting for his country was not discarded like a broken toy that a young girl had something better to do than cough herself to death. But Sophie knew it was a hunger that could never be satisfied, and that hurt more than anything that had happened to her. Her heart was not only flawed, but failing. Every second brought it closer to its final tick-tock, and as she grew weaker, her enemies grew stronger. The thought of her people enduring Adelaide's cruelty and soon Hakon's filled her with a deep, aching hopelessness. Oma, staring at Sophie, was silent, the way a simmering pot of milk is silent right before it boils over. She looked at Will and said, What have you dragged to our door? Nodding at Arno, she said, You're a thief, but that doesn't worry me, because we have nothing to steal. Then she turned her gaze to Sophie. But you're a dead princess who's not dead, and that worries me greatly. I heard about you days ago. Word travels fast in the dark wood. You made quite an impression in Dorhendensburg, saving that family from eviction. And those veterans? They'd marched to the end of the earth for you. She buttered a slice of bread and then pointed the knife at Sophie. You gave those people hope, girl, and that's a dangerous thing. There's no greater weapon in the world than hope. It's dangerous because it's powerful. And don't think for a second that Prince Hakon doesn't know it. If he catches wind that you escaped, he'll be kicking down doors trying to find you. You're going to bring a world of trouble our way. Oma, Will said sharply. Sophie is here because I want her to be. The things that have happened, they aren't her fault. Sophie looked up. No, Will, your grandmother's right to be worried. I shouldn't have come here. It's just, I was afraid. I wanted a safe place only for a few days. A quiet place. A place, her words trailed off. A place to what, Will asked. Sophie looked up at him. His gaze, clear and honest. He gave her the strength to say it. A place to die.